ice crystals. One cold November day in 1940, my mother lugged my four-year-old brother and I and several travel bags through Berlin. Our goal was Anhalter Bahnhof. The S-Bahn, as the local railway was called, was crowded with school-aged children and their luggage. The Minister of Internal Affairs, Dr. Joseph Goebbels, had ordered that all school-aged children and some of their teachers leave Berlin. The mood at the train station was a little subdued in this situation because parents and children did not know how long they would be apart. I, on the other hand, was not going to miss what I was leaving behind in the slightest. I was looking forward to being liberated from my torturous homework drillings in the evenings, followed by getting my ears boxed and being scolded. When the papers about the evacuation came to my class at school and we were to take them home to our parents to be signed, I hoped from the bottom of my heart that my parents would sign them and approve of the minister's decision. I had no feelings of any great love from my parents, so my hoping should not be anything shameful. They signed the papers, and KLV became the organization I would belong to for the next two years. As an aside, I can mention that even England had a similar organization, but after seeing a documentary on TV about it a few years ago, I thought it was awful. They used the principle of selection, which meant that the children gathered on the platform at the train station and people who wanted to house these children were allowed to pick the children they wanted to house. As a result, those children who did not look attractive to the villagers were the ones who ended up with the village school teachers or the priest for further steps. I thought this was a grim and inconsiderate way of dealing with the situation without the least little bit of organization. The German children who had relatives or close relatives in rural areas were of course allowed to stay with them if they wanted to. Others stayed in Berlin with their parents. My departure was, in other words, not a sentimental one. Instead, it was full of sheer curiosity over what was to come, plus a feeling of travel fever towards new adventures as I looked at my large suitcase that shook and hopped to the rhythm of the railway curves in Berlin, which were still not in ruins. My suitcase was full of new things, carefully packed by my mother, who was careful to give her daughter a certain status among her schoolmates. Anhalter Bahnhof was heard over the loudspeaker, and we eagerly pressed on towards our respective trains that were carefully assigned to us in our papers. All the gloomy mood from our departure had now completely vanished. We were met by marching music, joyful acclamations, flags, paper flowers, and streamers that decorated the trains. My class, or I should say a part of it, was put in the trust of one of our well-known teachers and two of the official functionaries from the Hitler Youth, two young women in their 20s. The orchestra played a tune that was even well known to the Swedes, Musi den zum Stadtelle hinaus. It later became a popular song recorded by Elvis Presley, Wooden Heart, and the train pulled away with its usual huffing and puffing, as steam engines do. To Schlesing, Annaberg, one of Germany's historically heroic places known for its freedom fighters against the Polish suppression during centuries of conquest from the Polish side. Five of us girls in the train compartment found each other right away. There was a succession of song and laughter. The different stops along the way provided entertainment courtesy of the local Hitler Youth organizations. Everything was well organized down to the finest detail. Helga, a blonde girl with lively blue eyes, who was born outside of marriage, had a mother who adored her and who knew all the lyrics to the songs that in Sweden were called chapbook songs because they were printed and sold for a few shillings at a time. They were at the same time humorous, gruesome, and captivating. Eva seemed to be a simple and calm individual whom we did not know that well given that she was from a different class at our school. Erika, well-built, stylish, and dark-haired, came from a highly educated family, and Ilsa, medium blonde, freckled, and jovial, who, with her Berlin dialect and dry humor, had the potential to be our favorite companion at all times. She had already treated us to many a good laugh with real humor at school. I remembered so well when one of our teachers explained the purpose of nose hairs as dust filters to prevent dust from entering our lungs. Ilsa waved eagerly with her hand and shouted happily with her genuine Berlin dialect that cannot be translated into English. In my uncle's nose, they looked out. Both the students and teachers laughed so much that the tears ran down our cheeks. 
or when we, before our KLV trip, were examined by the doctor and had to leave the obligatory urine test, embarrassed and shy, we handed over our samples to the stern nurse. Not Ilsa. She handed over her bowl with the words, There's a little shit in it, too. This caused the stern nurse to lose her composure for a split second, but she was able to make a disapproving look, but the rest of us could of course not help but laugh. Despite our different backgrounds, we got along really well and became known amongst the others as the hedgehogs during our time on the KLV trip when we were in the same camp. I do not know why, but our clique did not mind the expression. During our journey, with regrouping and extra trains and different situations in the long region of Schlesien, we got tired and the desire to stretch out and sleep came over us all more and more. But all trips come to an end, and thus even this one. We arrived at our destination, and the foggy landscape greeted us shivering and perhaps pale travelers. A group of nuns and a municipal leader in uniform greeted us in a friendly way, and at that small station there was a horse and carriage waiting for us. The driver took care of our luggage. We had a short walk to our camp, which was situated in a convent beside a refugee camp for refugees from the Baltic, and their kitchen was to provide us with food. We were about 20 girls who were now to be given a room and board, and we five who had become a clique were to share two rooms up in one of the towers of the convent. The wood-burning stoves spread their warmth over newly made and clean beds. We were surprised by the height of the mattresses on the small beds, but we were disappointed when the height soon sank down and we discovered that the mattresses were filled with straw. We took everything well and slept splendidly, the next day, we unpacked and put our things in the closet. We thought it was exciting up in the tower, which was closed off by a glass door that was directly connected to a narrow staircase. We had to do all the cleaning ourselves and were encouraged to decorate our Spartan room so that it did not look like a convent cell. The wood-burning stoves were looked after by the older Baltic girls from the neighboring camp. As is common for youngsters, we soon felt at home in our unusual environment. Winter arrived with snow, cold, and glittering ice crystals on our window panes. We were fascinated by these changing patterns that were created by the warmth from the wood-burning stoves. We were strictly forbidden to touch the fire, but the ban was difficult to follow when Helga received her every third day package from her mother, containing amongst, containing amongst other things, apples, which we secretly roasted over the fire in the stoves. Helga generously shared the contents of her package with the rest of us. Of course, our time was taken up with duties like schoolwork, cleaning, etc., but there was time left over for mischief. Lots of mischief, one might think, given that our levels of inventiveness were high, most of all, Helga's. One time, it almost went bad, quite badly for us. We five in the tower were quite isolated from our other friends, and we did not keep such close tabs on what was happening in the lower areas. After each cleaning of our section, it was time for the inspection by our H.J. Hitler Youth functionaries. We often placed discarded sinks and bowls from the storage room in front of the door and let them roll down the stairs, making noise that such material does when that happens. Sure, we were punished for our pranks with toilet cleaning, snow shoveling, and the like, while our other comrades were allowed to play games and partake in other leisure activities, but we could not resist. But that time, the stainless steel bowls started their clattering down the stairs. The noise was not met by high-pitched women's voices, but by manly ones that wondered what in the hell was going on. Amongst the upset words, we heard our teachers' apologies and explanations. We sat on our chairs in front of our beds, pale and afraid, terrified of what our prank had caused, our laughter was stuck in our throats, and Erica was almost ready to crawl under her bed when the door was thrown open, and outside stood our teacher with two high-ranking KLV functionaries, their faces red with anger. But obviously, the sight of our terrified beings made them calm down a bit and just said, So, this is what you look like, the ones who are responsible for the undisciplined behavior in this camp. Nothing more was said. And after that episode, our pranks of this sort on our H.J. functionaries came to an end, but they did not completely cease. There were other things that interplayed between our dispositions and Helga's ingenuity. As I mentioned earlier, 
Our catering was provided by the Baltic people, and their diet was certainly not like ours. Sometimes it was quite simply inedible. Have you tried duck egg gruel before? Lucky you. It tastes like something between beer posset, which people from the Swedish island of Gotland are supposed to love, and fermented Baltic herring. When it comes to the smell, the thick yellow gruel with its stale smell made one feel ill just by it coming in the vicinity of one's nose, and swallowing it was like eating vomit. But our teacher would not be bribed when it came to food. It was to be eaten, and that was that. The H.J. functionaries towed the line. The teacher herself ate the gruel. I do not know if she did that with a good appetite or with good acting abilities, but when she was finished, she left the table with the words, Now remain seated until the tureen and your plates are empty. She locked the dining area, and there we sat, 20 girls who felt ill because of that so-called human food. What to do with that nauseating soup? Throw it out the window? No, the snow would reveal our prank. But then Helga came up with a brilliant idea. In the nearby closet, there was a bunch of hot water bottles hanging. Rubber bottles with good screw caps. She pointed out that they were large and easy to fill. Even our H.J. leaders were with us about the idea of liberating us from the soup by pouring it into the bottles. We completed the maneuver while one of us listened by the door in case our teacher came back. It all went well, but our teacher probably wondered why there was so much running back and forth to the closet that particular night. It was not the sudden coldness that was the cause, but a certain emptying in the toilets and the rinsing that caused the activity. The Conspiracy In St. Annaberg's KLV camp, we bonded together to form a good comradeship. There were, of course, squabbles amongst 20-some teenagers between the ages of 12 and 14, but there were never any big quarrels between us. Articles about the silent opponents in the Third Reich were often published. These now brag about sabotage and tactics in their daily work that were aimed at damaging the regime, all from behaving arrogantly towards foreign guests to spreading rumors and unrest to the rest of the population. Unconsciously, I rendered a couple of these parasites harmless, but did not understand that until later when I followed the articles in a Swedish newspaper. A couple of aunts to two of my camping mates, who were cousins, visited our camp just before Christmas. They were warmly welcomed by our teacher and the H.J. functionaries, and we admired these well-dressed middle-aged beings. But something happened. Our comradeship was disturbed and we hedgehogs were for some reason rejected by the intimate circle that had taken shape in the lower corridors. In the evenings, the ants organized so-called story times for the girls downstairs, but we five upstairs were not allowed to join them. The atmosphere felt spiteful and artificial, and became, in an unexplainable way, destructive. One evening, out of curiosity and perhaps jealousy of the chosen ones, I snuck downstairs to listen to the storyline. I carefully cracked open the closed door of the room where the girls sat around on pillows in front of the two ants. They were not telling stories. No, they were making a long, intense row of dirty attacks on the camp in general and the KLV more specifically. The ants' well-painted lips were throwing dirt on our oasis. Upset and with sudden speed, I went to the H.J. leader's room and told on them. With some disbelief from her side, we snuck back down to the slightly ajar door and my words were confirmed. There was a real commotion. The leaders were contacted and the elegant ladies were taken away in disbelief by uniformed men. The two cousins were expelled immediately. They had to pack up and return home. The good mood soon returned to the camp, but with one difference. We hedgehogs became somewhat of favorites. Christmas came and the quarrels were soon forgotten with all the preparation. At the beginning of December comes St. Nicholas Day, which, according to German tradition, is an encouraged element for all children. They put their newly polished shoes outside the door where Nicholas fills them with all kinds of goodies. In our convent, there was one difference. We had to put our shoes in our bags to prevent mice from getting to the goods. During Advent, we were woken up one night by a covered truck that drove in low gear sneaking up towards our convent. But a truck's engine can always be heard, even when good attempts are made to cover it up. We looked out the window with great curiosity, but were ordered to immediately leave the windows and go back to bed. 
but we kept listening and wondering what on earth a covered truck was doing here. Even the unloading of it sounded a little creepy. What was happening? After some clattering, the truck drove away, and the explanation to it all was given on Christmas Day. After breakfast, we were all ordered to go down to the cellar where we found new toboggans, skis, and poles. With a cry of joy, we supplied ourselves two by two with toboggans. Erica would rather go skiing, but Ava and I went tobogganing down the many hills in St. Anberg. There was plenty of snow, and Christmas Eve went by quickly until evening came and it was time for the Christmas tree, candles, and many presents from home. During the time between Christmas and New Year, we met a farmer with a team of horses, which, with a loud neigh, stopped and asked those of us who were on our way to the tobogganing hills with our toboggans if we were good tobogganers, to which we of course replied with a loud yes. We told them that we knew all about how to move from right to left, slow down, and stop, which is done with the heels of one's boots, and we Berlin kids are somewhat of experts at it. We then bound our toboggans in a long chain, one after the other, behind the team, and they towed us away with cheers and songs by our camp, and of course, it was Helga who provided the funniest contributions. As usual, she had been the source of some tricks, and was ordered to clean the toilets instead of coming with us to the hills. She heard our laughter, and came running out with the round toilet brush high above her head, threw herself on the last bit of space in the last toboggan, and marked our curves from left to right with the brush. The villagers stood along the road and howled with laughter, something that was rather unusual for the otherwise so rugged people. Lost Many small clear streams that have carved deep grooves in the landscape run through St. Annaberg. They ran despite the cold and created ice crystals that cold January day in 1941. We five girls walked along the streams and watched the bubbles under the ice that was clear as glass. We talked about the birds and the bees, something that Erica and Helga knew more about than Ava and me. Helga and Erica talked while Ava made dreadful comments, but I thought it sounded logical from my own observations and fragments from the adult conversations I have heard. Ilsa wanted to make some cheeky additions, but Erica asked her to keep her dirty Berlin mouth shut. Erica had authority and was most often obeyed. I cannot remember more about their surnames than that Helga's ended in ski like mine. Eva and Ilsa had typical German professional names, while Erica was proud to have a Fon name. As an adult, I am grateful that I got explanations and insights into adult life in this natural and respectful way, which can be quite troublesome for a woman. My wish to never become a woman was a somewhat hasty prayer, because we had gotten lost in the stream gullies, which branched out endlessly. When we climbed up the sides, we saw nothing but forest and fields, no houses and no roads. To top it all off, it started to snow, which reduced our visibility to almost nothing. We walked and walked and froze. Helga tried to pep us with her chapbook songs, and I got asked about Sweden. Their questions took me back to an experience I had by the river in Morum in 1937. I was staying with a teacher, and together with a girl from the neighborhood, we walked along the river on a beautiful summer day. In front of us, in the distance, there was a loony who was mumbling to himself. I wanted to turn around. I have always felt uncomfortable around that type of person in Sweden where one could meet them every now and then, but they were never seen in Germany. My friend calmed me down and said that this loony was totally harmless and inoffensive, so we continued on our walk. But just as we passed him, this really ugly figure hollered and lifted a big rock to throw at us. We ran for our lives. I learned a lesson. Do not trust the mentally ill, no matter how much the people around me say that the person is harmless. The darkness began to fall. Tired and downhearted, we stumbled through the snow when we suddenly saw a few tiny rays of light and the contours of a road. We recognized where we were, and our arrival at the village, where the residents had just been informed by our leaders of our disappearance, which caused worry and commotion, was met with great relief. We avoided squabbling and reproaches in our rather poor condition, and were put straight to bed. Erika, Helga, and Ilsa were soon on their feet again. 
but Ava and I caught bad colds with high fever and thus received medical attention and care from our leaders. After all, they were responsible for us and took this opportunity as a tough test with an almost ardent compensation of exaggerated feelings of guilt. When this episode was over and our health was restored, we received a message saying that our KLV camp was being moved from northern Schlesien to Steinau and a newly built youth home because our convent was not seen to be especially healthy with its thick walls. With mixed feelings, we packed our things. We found out that the youth home would of course have different personnel and that we would be together with a school group from another part of Berlin. Materially, it was an improvement with a better kitchen, with food made by its own personnel, and a large, nice common room, wonderful dining rooms with views over Oder behind the plains, hygienic shower rooms, and light rooms. But 40-some teenagers did not quite feel at home there. Our previously unified hedgehog family became a thing of the past in this large group. Diligent adaptation and loss of identity was the price to pay for this higher standard. Though the summer in Steinau, with swimming, physical training, and lots of outdoor activities with sports and helping out on the nearby farms made us physically strong and healthy. Between the Locks Has the reader also felt a noticeable movement back in time in his or her life because of a scent, a sound, or sensation that almost causes a painful longing? That happened to me when I experienced the Borenschult locks on the Motala Canal towards Lake Boren in Sweden on a warm summer's evening. I was suddenly 50 years back in time when I saw youngsters diving from the lock doors down into the canal. The typical splashing sound that echoed between the lock walls when they dove, the water trickling between the logs, it all reminded me of my own and my comrades' lock pool in Steinau. It was the most fun retreat of the summer. It was not a real canal. It was a river that had been drawn through the town. We used to jump down from the locked door and let ourselves be supported by the current in the clear water. I wonder if descendants of the Polish conquerors have as much fun as we had, or if this river is also ruined and dirtied after 50 years of communist rule and their inconsiderate destruction of the environment. White Lilacs Steinau in Schlesien, 1941. A Swedish wanderer would pause in astonishment at the sight that met him or her at the south end of the little Schlesien town. In the setting sun, the reddish-brown blockhouse shone almost falloon red, an almost red ochre. The white window frames and the white flagpole in the front of the house further strengthened the similarities between it and a traditional Swedish estate building. Behind this house, in a dip, was a sporting facility. To the right, there was a building that strongly resembled a Greek temple, but it was used as a modern gym. This was the room that could quickly be transformed into an excellent theater. The architect must have fancied the Swedish and Greek building styles. The melding of these gave the room a perfect unity of beauty, style, and elegance. The excess of showy white lilac bushes lining the fence around the house, the sidewalks, and the other buildings gave the impression that Mother Nature wanted to give something extra of spring luxury to this particular area. The river odor shimmered in the distance like a glittering tiara. It was a wonderful spring evening. On the steps to the blockhouse, our modern youth shelter that from the outside looked so peaceful Sadar substituting Schlesien youth leader, completely dejected. Song and laughter were heard from both the main floor and upstairs. The kind Schlesien girl had never had to deal with city kids before, but this spring event I lay quietly and listlessly in my bed while the others romped and teased each other. Our usual leaders were at a meeting and my friends took advantage of the situation. As the saying goes, when the cat's away, I usually partake in all the fun, but before our superintendent went to the meeting, I had gotten both a spanking and a thorough scolding. A stranded barge in odor had enticed me, a poorly built raft had capsized, and I had come home to our camp in awful shape, my typical bad luck. Earlier, when I had ridden on an ice sheet, the same thing happened to me. Before the sunset had taken away the colors, 
I felt a light vibration in the metal bed, and I got up quickly. Slowly, a column of tanks and trucks with soldiers came driving by on the road. We ran to the windows. Shall we pick lilacs for them? Someone called. With cheers, and without consideration for our clothing, which was our nighties, we opened the windows, jumped out, and picked lilacs from the overfull bushes. Bouquet after bouquet were given to the young soldiers, who started to sing. Truck after truck were honored, while we laughed and wished the soldiers luck. When the last one had driven by, we had to comfort our poor young leader and promise her that we would be good and go to bed if she would not tell the superintendent on us. We all kept our word, but a few weeks later, a letter came from a young lieutenant. Dear girls, if you only knew what joy and encouragement you gave us when we, depressed and tired, drove through Steinau. It's not easy to leave one's home country when there's such a spring mood in the air. I myself am an orphan and have no one to grieve for me if I should fall in battle. Just then, I thought that everything was meaningless. Words like, die for your father country, fight for Germany, seemed so unreal to me somehow. That was the mood I was in when we drove by your beautiful youth shelter. Like a sign from above, it seemed to me, when you ran out and showered us with white lilacs, it was so wonderfully beautiful somehow and I'm ashamed of my gloomy thoughts. It is for you that we fight, to keep the purity, joyfulness, and soundness of the German youth for a world that needs it. As a memento for this unforgettable evening, I have saved a little white lilac branch in my wallet. I and my comrades thank you for your encouragement and the joy you have given us. That is what the superintendent read to us at the dinner table. And, she added, as punishment for your disobedience, we will save up for a field post package at least once a month. That punishment is one we took gladly. A beautiful friendship grew between 30 girls and a lieutenant, but not many packages were sent. He was killed in battle quite early in the Russian campaign, and 30 pairs of girls' eyes cried bitter tears when they received the sad news. The laughter in the camp was quieted for several days. One night, a few of the girls snuck out with a reef bound of leaves from the lilac bushes. The flowers had wilted long ago, but when the wreath, after being tossed into the river odor, had floated away, it looked like it had started to bloom with glittering white lilacs. But maybe it was just the moonlight that reflected off of the wet leaves. The Four-Leaf Clover between the two buildings, the youth shelter and the gymnasium, and the gymnasium, we girls ran and talked gaily and full of hope about the coming youth day when the hall would be transformed into an elegant theater. The magic, if I may call it that, with that building impresses people to this very day. The sports hall got so fully transformed that only the shell was recognizable. On the youth day in August, we were to show what we had learned and achieved in song, theater, recital, etc. Everything was far from being political, so my number was to sing a Swedish hit song as part of the Nordic element in performance. I had heard a hit that was played on the radio during my visit to Sweden a couple of years earlier that was on one of the records on the spring-driven gramophones. The tune was easy, and it even sounded to me as if it began in German. The youth orchestra learned the song according to my instructions, and I looked excitedly forward to my performance day. We were to rehearse a few more times before the dress rehearsal, and on the way from one of these rehearsals, I shouted gladly, Look! A four-leaf clover! My friends started looking for more right away, but without any luck. When we arrived to the shelter, our superintendent met us with the words, There will be no performance for Vera. Your parents have sent a message from Berlin, saying that you will be going home in a couple of days so that you can go with your father and brother on a holiday to Bromberg. Your mother, who was working at Apfia, checking letters from Sweden during the war, must stay in Berlin. I stared angrily at the four-leaf clover. Humbug. Four-leaf clover? What rubbish. I did not discover that it really was a lucky clover until many, many years later, when I had moved to Sweden. 
the hit that I knew so well was sung on a TV show, Be mir rest du schön, not schön in German as I understood it, but in Yiddish. Just think, I could have proudly and gladly stood there on stage and sung at the top of my lungs and danced all the steps to a Jewish-American hit that had been imported to Sweden and that at that time was something of a protest song against Germany in front of high-ranking National Socialist functionaries. So it really was a lucky clover after all. Do you remember what an outcry there was in the Swedish media when the Finnish singer, when the Finnish singer Arya Sejonma sang Zara Leander's well-known pop songs from movies from the Third Reich at the Nobel Party in Stockholm? Of all the Nazi phobia potentates, the journalist and politician Ingrid Sigersted Wilberg shouted loudest about revenge. Arya would not only be forced to publicly apologize, she would also face drastic obstacles when pursuing her career, etc. Poppies. It was hot, very hot. The overcrowded train steamed with heat and raced together with the engine, which pulled us huffing and puffing through Schlesien towards Breslau. I was the only one left from the Steinau camp. I would not be convinced by the director's assertions that other KLV camps were much worse than ours. We had a wonderful time together on the vacation in Bad Schwarzenberg, a small picturesque former hostel in the mountains in as far as Schlesien is concerned, a well-known health resort. I visited my grandmother in a nearby seaside resort that she occasionally visited to relieve her rheumatism. Collecting different and colorful stickers was a hobby of ours, and we took long walks through the villages, looking for them, just as the visitors to the 1994 Winter Olympics in Norway did. Breslau turned out to be a big city that in many ways reminded me of Berlin, with its big apartment buildings and screeching trams. On the outskirts of Breslau, there was a mighty fortress that looked like a medieval fairy tale castle with pinnacles and towers. It turned out that this was the meeting place for KLV members who wanted to stay in the organization. And what a red display of colors that surrounded the fortress. The poppy field in different stages of maturity completely dominated the surroundings. The fortress was an exciting place for us, and we enjoyed our complete freedom for two weeks in this fairy tale environment. Units met, left, and new ones arrived. Without knowing about the properties of poppy seeds, we ate the delicious ripe ones we found and got intoxicated. In that state, we thought we were superior to most everything and did a bunch of crazy things. We jumped off the high wood-burning stoves onto our beds with bronze headboards and beautiful ornaments, surely antiques. All this noise prompted a thin, sharp-nosed noblewoman to suddenly appear. She was the owner of the fortress who lived in one of the wings. After consulting with the leaders, it was decided that our punishment would be to stack the wood in a woodshed, and the wood would be transported from the yard with a wheelbarrow. And, said the strict noblewoman, I can hear the wheels on the wheelbarrow from my open window, and I want to hear them, back and forth, so it's not worth it to be lazy. Understood? We understood all right, but what she had not understood was that she was dealing with clever Berlin kids. We put one piece of wood in the wheelbarrow instead of filling it, and pushed it back and forth as ordered, and had, in that way, turned our punishment into merry mischief. But after just two weeks, our freedom came to an end. It was just as well. Our consumption of poppy seeds would not have been good for us in the long run. In a group of 20 girls, we came to a well-disciplined camp in Lauban with observant and experienced leaders. We could ascertain that freedom was good, but there could be too much of a good thing, so we found a security and comfort right away in our new surroundings. Heidi Lauban Fall, winter, 1941 to 1942. Lauban, a small town in Schlesien, an idyllic place with smaller rows of houses where the streets are lined with hostels and lanes that blended into well-kept gardens between the houses. Our KLV camp was located in one of these houses. This was a totally different environment than the modern youth camps in Steinau by the Oder, my previous location. In Steinau, 
The bedrooms had bunk beds, about eight to ten in each room. But here, in Lauban, each room had three comfortable beds and a really good desk by a large window. A big cabinet with a mirror on it emphasized the hostile decor even more. A rug on the floor and a big bowl with a jug on a sturdy steel stand in white in a curtained corner made our morning and evening toiletries really private and undisturbed. There was a common bathroom with showers and toilets in secluded areas, which was different from Steinau, where everything was new and modern, but in the everything for everyone style where there was no integrity. The whole hostel housed about 20 girls between the ages of 13 and 14. We had a male leader, which was quite unusual. He was a married man who lived downstairs with his family. We girls were here of our own free will from different camps in Schlesien, and we were all from Berlin, but from different parts of the city. We three girls in our room were, for example, from a fashionable part of the city called Charlottenburg in the middle of Berlin. The second one was from the eastern Berlin working class area called Moabed, and I was from Steglitz in West Berlin. Karen, Heidi, and I. Karen and I often quarreled. We got into arguments and heavy discussions about Sweden. Our common ties to Sweden, I with my Swedish mother and Karen with her Swedish grandmother, should have made us friends. But Karen's completely negative attitude to Sweden in general, and especially to Swedes, irritated me something awful. And once we ended up in a fist fight, Heidi broke it up. She had just come into the room and shouted, dismayed, you're not a bunch of seven-year-olds, you're crazy. Her high-pitched voice, Berlin dialect, and her frank protest surprised us so much that we, red-faced and sweating, took a breather on our beds and stared at our otherwise so laid-back and sullen friend who was almost well-spoken to hide her Moabit origins. A little calmer, Heidi continued, You can talk a little calmer about Sweden now, the country that is for me the one without war in Northern Europe, where the capital city is Stockholm and there are many waterways and I've read The Wonderful Adventures of Nils by Selma Legelov. I don't know any more than that. Karen burst out, No war, but they're mean. My grandmother says that they sell the poor. They sell the poor children in the villages by making them stand on a stool and selling them to mean farmers who beat them and make them work until they drop from exhaustion. My grandmother hates that country so much so that she won't call it by name. She calls it a mean frost nest. She came to Germany with my grandfather, who met her on a farm while he was on one of his many trips through the country, and where she worked under horrible conditions. Grandpa fell for the blonde, fine-looking woman, fell in love with her, and took her to Berlin. He thought she was too beautiful to wear herself out. They got married, for she was not only beautiful but also wise, so he never regretted it. How romantic! We broke out, as only teenagers do. Tell us more. I don't know that much more, other than that she had a terrible childhood. Her mother, a farmer's daughter, got kicked out of the house when her parents found out she was pregnant outside of wedlock. Her mother died when she was nine, and she was sold at an auction. Can you imagine selling children? All her life she was called illegitimate and teased because of that, until Grandpa came. Grandpa always said that a beautiful eagle came from Germany and took her away to a place where she never wanted to leave. She never returned to Sweden, a frost nest full of tears and work with mean people. She warns everyone who thinks about going there. I would not find out until much later that Karen's story was true, that poor children were auctioned off to the lowest bidder. The municipality paid child support for these children, Whoever charged the lowest fee for the child's care got to buy him or her, a practice that was continued far into our own century. It was not wild fantasies or exaggerations, she told, that incited me to defend Sweden. I told her about my summers in Sweden that got me to see Swedes as friendly people and about the things I saw as amusing, like that the elderly drank their coffee from a saucer and that boys had long hair while girls had short hair. And one should be careful with priests, I said. And Karen wondered, why them? Well, during one of my summer visits between 1933 and 1939, I ended up staying with a priest in Algras and was treated like a slave instead of like a summer child from Berlin, cleaning, doing dishes, and emptying different disgusting pots. 
Yes, you see, that's the way they are. I was right, wasn't I? But I continued my story about all the other summer visits. One time I stayed with a well-to-do gardener and his family of seven kids in Helsingborg. They had a wonderful summer house by the Sound, where a glimpse of Denmark could be seen through the eternal sunny haze. I also told them about my experiences in Morum, at a teacher's place, and about the good cookies at the baker's place in Tidaholm, my adventures in Helsingland during my stay with a couple in a village school. All these trips and summer holidays in Sweden for Swedish descendants were organized through the Swedish church in Berlin. Heidi, who was so mature in her comments, despite her still undeveloped body, said with her usual laid-back high German, Karen's grandmother talked about Sweden at the turn of the century, but everything changes. We can of course see how everything has become better in our own country in such a short time. Karen and I still bickered every once in a while about Sweden, but we never really quarreled after that. We three became the best of friends, despite the saying that one person always gets left out in a threesome. Heidi's good qualities always smoothed things over. She was careful, reliable, and clean. She made our beds, which she was a master at, and she carefully folded our clothes, which was appreciated by our leaders when they came and inspected our rooms. After a while, I understood that Heidi did not have any family. She never wrote any letters home or to anyone else when we had our letter times. She never talked about herself, and when we asked her questions, she got sullen and surly. Just before Christmas, I wrote to my mother and asked her to divide my Christmas presents into two packages and address one to Heidi. I was not usually tender-hearted, but I could not stand the thought of Heidi finding her spot empty while the rest of us cheered and laughed as we compared our presents from our parents and other relatives. We always had to give our letters unsealed to our H.J. superintendent. He read some of them in order to get an idea of who we were and our attitudes, I think. I got called into his office, and in his hand, he held my letter and talked to me in a friendly manner. You surprise me, Vera. I would like to see this kind of comradeship amongst the National Socialists. This was really a good example. But, he continued, we're working with Heidi's situation. She will definitely not be without presence. Her life hasn't been easy, but let that stay between us. Promise? And it wasn't because of your letter that I called you here. You won't be spending Christmas with us. Instead, I've recommended that you and a couple of other frail girls spend the holiday in a recreational home in the mountains. You may not feel very fragile, but after your recent intestinal operation, you probably need a little extra care. You'll be spoiled with food, rest, spas, fresh air, and a wonderful environment. You're welcome back to us in six weeks with round cheeks and new energy. I came back, as he had predicted, with energy and the ability to take on new challenges. My stay at the recreational home was a real paradise. There was one episode I will never forget and that I judge as a typical National Socialist goal. We were in the waiting room, awaiting our turn to the health pool. A functionary from HJ, who often checked in on us, ran quickly up the softly carpeted marble stairs to the luxurious decor. He asked, surprised why we were sitting there and waiting his face red with anger. He saw the rope that has blocked off the first class entrance and ordered the personnel to immediately remove the chain from the staircase and allow us entrance to the bathing area. Shall rich bigwigs of both genders have priority over sound German youth? We all have the right to first class. The chain was taken away immediately and we were given access to the luxurious spa department that we thought was out of this world. With wide open eyes and enchantment, we entered into the spa with a solemnity as if we had been transformed into fairy tale princesses. Sunken marble bathtubs, artfully ornamented taps, expensive lighting. Yes, for about an hour, we got to experience an existence that is otherwise only enjoyed by the so called upper class. Nothing was impossible for National Socialism. Those of us who had enviously sat and waited for those who had priority to the spa now felt really privileged. With this episode came new rules. Bathing days were subsequently divided up between the groups one, two, and three so that no one went without the experience 
of luxury. One day, a propaganda film was made about our model recreational home. About 30 youth with different health issues were staying there. In one of the wings was the boys' department. The illnesses ranged from heart trouble, weak lungs, or a need to rest after an operation. The days passed by, filled with bathing, walks, rest, light treatments, and continual mealtimes. Six weeks went by quickly, as did Christmas. We were spoiled rotten with presents, candy, and glittering Christmas trees. I experienced a lot that year. Steinau, Schwarzenberg, a shorter stay in West Prussia with my father and brother, Fraunberg in Breslau, the gathering camp for all those who voluntarily wanted to stay in KLV, Lauban, and the home in the mountains. Would 1942 be filled with as diverse stays and experiences? Suddenly, one day, my roommate and I saw Heidi sitting at the desk by the window, leaning on her arms and hands, crying uncontrollably. Terrified, we, Karen and I, wondered what had caused this transformation of the otherwise always so self-restrained girl. Between sobs, she said, I'm getting adopted. We stood there at a loss in this unusual situation, but Karen pulled herself together and said angrily, you never talk about yourself, even though Vera and I have spilled our guts out. You just kept quiet and looked sullen. Tell us about yourself so we can understand what's going on. Heidi stopped sniffling, and with a deep sigh, she replied, I'll tell you, I just have my mother. Father took off in 1933, where I don't know. He was a communist, a mean man who I had never missed. He drank, fought, screamed, and was unpleasant. He always called me ugly, never by my name. Mother got stranger and stranger too. She started to drink and got sloppier, and in the end didn't care about anything. The child welfare department came for visits, scolded her and gave her a warning which she took out on me by scolding and spanking me. I cleaned, tidied things up, cooked to avoid getting punished, and the child welfare department was more satisfied on their next visit. The only fun I had was at the Hitler Jugend evenings. The neighborhood kids were mean and often yelled ugly communist kid at me. Last year, when holidays started, I gave up. I couldn't go on. I sat on the school steps and I cried. I didn't want to go home. My teacher saw me, contacted NSV, National Socialist Welfare, and I didn't have to go home. So I was sent around and interrogated. I came to Frauenberg, you know, where we all met. My mother got picked up, but I don't know where. She paused, and we interjected at the same time. Are you a communist? She glared at us. Does everything have to be about politics? Of course not. I never was. Our superintendent said to me that I would get a good life. I was good in school, clean, and orderly. We nodded in agreement. But I'm so ugly. And she certainly was. She had straggly brown hair and tightly combed braids, small brown eyes in a freckled face, plus a sullenness that emphasized her ugliness. But what a friend she was. Heidi continued. Imagine... A family from Zellendorf is coming to meet me. Zellendorf, where rich people live. But they probably won't want me. They've lost their only son in Russia. The father is an officer who had been injured in the war. That's all I know. And they'll be here any time now. We quickly helped Heidi to rinse her tear-stained face and tie fresh bows in her braids. When she was called by our girl leader, Karen called after her, Smile, smile, you'll look cuter. After a while of waiting, the door opened and in came a uniformed officer on whose shoulders shone stripes and stars, and we understood that this was the man that Heidi had told us about. She herself came in with an elegantly dressed lady who protectively put her arm around her shoulders. Heidi, red, nervous, but yet happy. After we had introduced ourselves, the lady said, "'We'll be away with your roommate for a few hours,' so that we can get to know each other. We'll be staying at Lauban for a few days before we leave and take Heidi with us. Heidi came back in the evening, but was it really the same Heidi? She was a radiating, happy girl with her hair cut in a beautiful style, new clothes, and her arms full of presents to us. 
we were of course very curious about how it all transpired. Imagine that they said they were so lucky to get a girl like me in their lives. They said that. A few days later, we waved goodbye to our roommate. She stood in the window of the train between a couple of happy adoptive parents. We had lost a good friend, but it would not be long until Karen and I would go home to our parents. February Slush One cold, wet, and gray February morning in 1942, our female leader knocked on our door and came hastily into our room with the news that Karen and I were to return home in a couple of days. Everyone who turned 14 during the first half of the year had to prepare for vocational training, work experience, etc. in their hometowns. Through the door I heard many shouts of joy, but I threw myself dejectedly onto my bed. I felt deserted and heavy-hearted. My friends talked gaily in the halls, but for me, all I heard echoing in my head with horror was my mother's statement when she visited me in the hospital after my intestinal operation. Your father and I have decided that you were to start at the School of Commerce. With the youthful view of time intervals, I took the decision calmly. It was a long time before I had to go there, but now the time had come. The School of Commerce. In my eyes, it was a scary brick building that sent shivers up my spine when I passed it on my way to or from the big sports ground. The School of Commerce. The tears started to run as I thought despairingly that I have to get out of this. The water pitcher and handbowl on the sturdy white steel had a sharp edge at the same height as the scar after my operation. Once I cut myself on that. Just think, if I should do that again. The next morning, I hit my scar as hard as I could against the sharp edge so that the whole stand and everything on it tumbled to the floor. My venture really scared my roommates. I stood there lightly bleeding from my scar in the middle of the distress. The leaders were called in. The gentle doctor came, but he just put a band-aid on the sore with the words, no reason to panic, it's just a scratch. Continue packing for your trip home. The camp leader, on the other hand, thought that I should rest for a few hours and eat my breakfast in bed. I was deeply ashamed of myself. No one who had been so worried about my injury suspected that I had done it on purpose. That was an experience for life. Never again did I do such a thing. As a passage in this section, I would like to tell you about our camp doctor. He was a very pleasant middle-aged man who had a clinic in Laubon that was surrounded by a beautiful park. His employees were nuns, and his patients were treated with the greatest tenderness. Before my intestinal operation, I stayed at that clinic for observation. During the flu epidemics, my friends were given isolated treatment there to prevent the flu from spreading to the whole KLV home. On the appropriate registration form, we had to state our religious affiliation, EV, Evangelist, Protestant, K for Catholic, GGL for the new form of religious belief. GGL is an abbreviation for Gottglaubig, which is a belief in a higher power but without biblical texts and membership in a congregation. I personally belong to that faith. The nun's reaction was surprisingly positive in contrast to what I had expected. Somehow, I became their favorite, was treated like a young idealist who was to have the best care. To this day, I look at nuns with admiration when I meet them. Friends who came under their care later on often said to me, the nuns ask about you. You have really given our camp a good reputation with them. Still, I did no sort of brown nosing with them, nor did I act in any way unnaturally. When I write these lines, I still wonder about what gave them that good impression. It was time to take farewell of my time with KLV, a time that for my part lasted for a year and a half. This organization exceeded everything that could be called good organization ability, but that is the way things were under Dr. Goebbels. Things got done. Millions of children from the affected large cities escaped the Allies' terror bombings by being evacuated to different camps with teachers, leaders, and youth functionaries. Good support, care, and supervision, summer and winter adventures with games, walks, and relaxation, but also with weekdays of school or helping on the farms during the busy sowing and harvest times in the areas around the KLV homes. 
Now we were to be repatriated to our parental homes with fathers and mothers who arbitrarily decided on career choices and future plans for their children without asking them. Listlessly, I threw my belongings into my bags, which caused my H.J. leader to remind me of my sloppiness. She repacked my things properly. One last night, where Karen and I talked quietly while our new roommate slept blissfully. We talked about Heidi and fantasized about how things turned out for her, fantasized about our own futures, and about Berlin, still a spot of light in reluctant homesickness. I remember discreetly asking if we could meet up in the Swedish church sometime. But there I ran into a dead end. No, not in your life. Grandma told me that it's a real Jewish haven with the new priest who hides a bunch of shady characters from the Gestapo, whose tender care they should end up under, as she put it. With the comprehension, Karen is exaggerating again, but we are not going to fight on our last night. I fell asleep before the inevitable. Our travel day came, and towards dusk, the train chugged towards and into a darkened Berlin. Father greeted me with the words, Mother is at home with the flu. No welcome home, no tender words of endearment. In the distance, I saw how Karen was hugged by her relatives with exclamations of joy. She disappeared with her family in the crowd towards the exit, and we never met again. Father and I walked down the stairs to the subway and our train, which would take us to Stiglitz and the bedridden mother. SS I encountered the SS three times, not in the way one would think after hearing all the propaganda against National Socialist Germany, that the SS was everywhere and made life miserable for the citizens. Quite the opposite. First, it was quite rare to meet them and second, the SS were absolutely not some kind of horrifying figures that were generally feared. On the contrary, they were seen as decent, helpful citizens. That is my experience. The reader can form his or her own opinion after reading my stories. The Autumn Leaves I had had enough. That bloody school of commerce whose teachers gave me the most unfair grades but I did not dare take these awful grades home and show my school-obsessed parents. I must get away. Away. I checked out what would be appropriate to take with me when I ran away. A big net bag would have to do. A blanket, warm clothes, food, toiletries, and my favorite book, The Girl in the Soldier's Coat, which was partly what inspired me to make my decision to be a soldier on the front line. If it was possible, during the Napoleonic War, it should not be so impossible in the fall of 1942. I biked off to the east, according to my compass. I neither cried nor felt afraid. I just felt angry decisiveness as the wheels rolled along through the crunching autumn leaves that lined the streets of Berlin. Hour after hour, eastwards, and soon, my journey took me through rural suburbs and the darkness began to fall even darker in the compact blackout time. I slowed down, and with a weak flashlight, I tried to make my way to a suitable spot to spend the night. A soft rain had started to fall, so I had to hurry up and find a dry spot. I chose my sleeping spot under the thick pine in a hollow with grass, and with my raincoat on as protection, I had it quite good and enjoyed the stillness as I listened to the subsiding rain and fell asleep. I was suddenly awoken by a clattering cooking pot and voices in the dawning light. Behind the pine, I found a barbed wire fence. At first, I could not understand the context, but I understood from the foreign voices that I had spent the night right beside a prison camp. Carefully and as quietly as possible, I packed up my things and led my bike carefully away from there before mounting my bike and riding away to the east. It turned out to be a beautiful sunny day, and I was hungry, and looking for a good place to stop and eat made me bewildered. There was a fence on both sides of the road. Where was I going? The forest in the distance looked inviting and smelled good in the warm autumn sun. I found a big hole in the fence, where I, fortunately or unfortunately, could crawl through with my bike despite the trouble with the pedals and the handlebars, which always wanted to get tangled up in the barbed wire, no matter how I tried to avoid it. I could have gotten badly tangled up in the wire. 
I had not thought of packing any band-aids or first aid kit, but I got through in one piece, and after that sweaty task, I could finally find a place to rest in the sun. I sat down beside a creek and enjoyed my surroundings as my hunger subsided with a few pieces of bread and sausage. My surroundings seemed to me to be a little too well kept for undisturbed nature. The creek was well shaped, and the trees and the bushes reminded me more of a park than a wild forest. The ditches and embankments seemed to be planned. I thought about this unusual environment, but did not reflect any deeper about it, and somehow I started to regret that I ran away. What is going to happen? What is going to happen now? My lunchbox will soon be empty, and how will I, a 15-year-old girl, become a soldier? I am probably quite crazy anyway, but what is done is done, and it is getting more and more ignominious to come crawling back home and meeting not only spankings, but also laughter and scorn. Given that my current surroundings seemed so interesting, I decided to go exploring. But first, I would wash up in the creek and comb my long hair. The creek was shallow, and I could easily jump over to the other side where the water looked clearer. I quickly planted my one foot down in the middle of the creek to get ready to jump and sank. Quicksand. My one leg was stuck. Inexorably stuck. I desperately tried to get hold of my bike, which was lying on the bank, when I heard a lofty voice talk to me. What is this girl doing here? I looked up and saw a tall man in full soldier's equipment with the shiny tag that glimmered blindingly in the sunshine. A pair of strong arms helped me out of that precarious situation, and I found myself suddenly with soldiers who looked at my piteous figure with surprise. The feeling of wretchedness in this situation gave me tears of anger, but humbleness also radiates courage. I want to be a soldier. And then it turned out this way. My voice hiccuped while I was led to a security building with an office. In the office, there were several men with shining SS badges on their uniform coats. One chauffeur, squad leader, ordered a warm drink for me, and over a steaming cup of hot chocolate, I had to tell them about my trespassing on the practice field and why I ended up in the SS barracks area. An order was given to mend the fence. To my story, he made the laconic comment, a girl like you should not be beaten, but what to do to avoid mixing in people and paperwork? He got up and disappeared for a few minutes. A couple of the other men talked calmly with me and tried to get me to forget my wretched situation young, handsome soldiers that did not leave me unaffected and who made me angry in my wet, dirty clothes. The chauffeur came back looking happy and relieved. We will drive you, bike and baggage, to the intersection of Markelstrasse. From there, you will continue on home. We would appreciate it if you didn't tell anyone about your stay here. Just tell your parents about a normal running away from home that you regret. Your shame is something you'll have to live with but we'll do what we can to discreetly get your father to stop hitting you. It shouldn't be hard to do, given that your father is a member of the SA. Your parents have probably reported you missing to the federal police, in which case you will tell even them about a normal running away from home. We trust you. And with a certain lightning in his look, he continued, because a soldier has to be able to keep quiet, right? I nodded and was driven in the back of a truck together with my bike and bags to Berlin to the intersection of Markelstrasse. On our way, one of the young SS men snuck a paper into my hand with his name and field post number. Write. Write and tell me, he whispered in my ear. Hermann Hacke. And field post number. At the intersection of Scholstrasse and Markelstrasse, the small military truck came to a stop and I continued on alone. With both dread and the feeling of being abandoned somehow, I approached my home, but my secret gave me some sort of comfort and strength, which I was a little proud of. I met my upset mother at the door. I had to get washed up and change my stiffly dried clothes to good clothes to go to the police for an interrogation. The police station was a little ways away from our place. I told them about a normal, regretful running away from home and they were not the least bit troublesome. It was, after all, just for a day. 
My prank was not reported to the school or the Hitler Youth Center. It was kept within the family. Father was, of course, outraged, but his obligatory spanking with the bamboo cane, which he always took down from the bookcase behind the clock, did not happen. Spanking never happened again. But after his thorough scolding, he did not say a word to me until Christmas of 1942-43. His spankings must have immediately stopped because he was contacted by someone after this episode, and it must have been a person or people he highly respected. This was one of my confrontations with the SS. The story could have ended here, but it had a sequel. A romantic one. Herman Hecke gave me many moments of support and hope, but I did not dare get his letters sent to my home. Instead, I exchanged letters under general delivery in another name, Sigrid Lampion, and it had a catch to it. I could not pick up the letters myself. I had to get someone who was older than me to do it. The Big Dipper The field post number and Herman Hecke gave me many moments of comfort. As I said, I did not dare get his letters sent to my home address, so our exchange of letters was done under general delivery. My letters were picked up by a neighbor's girl who was in on it all. Our letter writing gave a worthwhile exchange of ideas, hopes, both personal and political, and went on for a few months. But a secret never stays that way forever when a third person is involved. The neighborhood's girl, Inga Sella, met a few of my classmates during a preparatory job on our school holiday and told them about it. Their mothers knew my mother, and letters disappeared from their hiding place under the sturdy wardrobe. I was both sad and lonely again. My letters went unanswered until one letter reached me anyway through Inga Sella, the last one. Herman wanted to meet me at Feuerbach subway station, which still goes by that name, just like the subway. It was one of those early spring evenings at the beginning of March when the weather can still turn cold. I told my parents I was going out for an extra job with the Hitler Youth, and with that white lie, I could go to my first date, a little shaky with hope. Like a normal teenager, I wanted to wear a little more attractive clothes than the HJ uniform on my first secret date, but the circumstances did not allow that. Herman met me at the station dressed in the familiar black uniform and held his peaked cap under his arm. He looked at me seriously and said, Our meeting will be short. I'm not allowed to exchange letters with you without your parents' permission until you turn 16. As for me, I'm leaving for a mission far away that I'm not allowed to talk about. You are young and sweetly innocent. He put his pointer finger under my chin and gave me a gentle kiss on the lips. As if he had done something improper, he quickly put his hat on his head and disappeared down the steps towards the platform. Before he disappeared, he turned around and made a friendly gesture that changed into a correct Hitler greeting. In a daze, I went home on darkened streets that were hardly lit up by the stars. I pressed my fingers to my lips. I did not know if I should be happy or sad. I had a strange feeling where I was walking. I remember the Big Dipper with its seven twinkling stars. The facades of the houses were still in one piece, and some of the beautiful ornaments were so typical for the turn-of-the-century architecture. Only a few weeks later would many of them gape empty with burned-out stinking holes or lay in a pile of ruins. The stars would no longer be mirrored in the blacked-out apartment windows. The terror bombings would begin, and even our street would be affected. <laughs>